I just saw on the Twitter wall that someone is looking forward to the next talk about web fonts. It's not exactly about web fonts. Um, it's about typography, that's true. I didn't put the, the name of my title, like the title of my talk on the slide because it's a little bit clunky. It didn't even fit on the program. But it's going to be about typography and I consider typography pretty universal or medium independent and although I totally have a print background, I think most of the things are uh, applicable to all kinds of media, like a few scenes, silk screen print posters, or work on the web, or with ebooks. Um, and something that I'm noticing, although I'm super excited about uh, the possibilities today in digital media and even about ebooks and stuff like this, I see a lot of these kind of articles popping up and talks popping up uh, that uh, maybe coming from web designers more, that they think that web, web typography is super complicated, it's horrible, it's broken even. I don't agree at all. I mean, I could just talk about how idiotic baselines on the web are for 60 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. Um, one of the maybe better Articles, long, really long article you've seen was by Robin Rendel recently about new web typography. And he, uh, I highlighted this here, is one of these people who are calling for new rules or distinct rules for web typography and new rules and that we have to figure it out and that we need guides. And I don't know where this is coming from. I, as a Typographer think is I don't I, there are no rules you could follow. There's not this checklist you have to go through and then you have nice or working typography and it's not this and this and this these steps. Uh, and I'm wondering where this is coming from, but I totally get what you find maybe intimidating about typography when I sat through the Angular JS talk this morning where I thought, oh, I'm probably the only person in the room who hasn't even heard of this and was totally like, totally over my head and thinking, yo, this has to be, somehow um, has to be m easier than, than this seems. So I think we just have to acknowledge that these are different professions or real professions and that you of course don't learn how to typeset or do typography just by doing it in two weeks. I studied this as uh, a full course, like you studied maybe computer science or something. And I think if we just apply some uh, good thinking or use media um, like in a, in a thoughtful way, then all the things that we have to be careful or think about will just come up themselves. So Robin is suggesting that we should go back and uh, read Jan Schichol's books or look at the old rules and then find out what new rules could apply. And I totally encourage you to do that. And there's also not this one type book you should read. It's, it's I think the cue is in reading several books and then just um, like think about it and make up your own guides or rules. Um, so I have to disappoint you that there are no rules for typography and I think we also don't need some, but of course there are rules or principles in communication that are pretty universal for everything. So there's this principle that everyone heard about, you sending a message, that's the signal, and if you encode it in the right way, the other end can decode it and get what you want to say. Then there are the principles of optics and proportions, so like heavy things on top look like they fall down, so don't put a heavy dark image on the top if you want to have really tiny text below. Like things that are supposed to be in the center should be a little bit above. These are principles that you have probably heard of in, in high school. Then there's of course some color theory and contrast that you have colors that go together and you have tone and use. These are like the principles that communication designers uh, usually deal with or learn of in, in school and then apply. But these are not strict rules. These are best practices or guides or principles maybe you can understand. But there are some rules that uh, have to do with typesetting more than typography and these have to do with orthography, and these are in Germany, as we're in German. Uh, in Germany, it has, of course, a DIN norm for all of that. Um, you have official orthography, and you have the DIN 5008 that is specifying typesetting rules or typesetting um, 
guides or something like this. You don't even have to buy a proper typography book for this because they're in the beginning of every Duden that probably all German high school kid got when they were like maybe 12 years old. In the beginning, before you have all the definitions for words, you have the typesetting instruction or the typesetting rules that cover stuff like what are the proper quotation marks, what are the proper dashes, when you use what, how does an apostrophe look like. And at the end of the day, these are really the only rules that are there that we should follow, and it's sadly also, I, I have to break it to you, that is also what everyone is judging web typography about or by. So if you have a super nice web font, nicely set, and you use the wrong quotation marks, then it's just in the eye of almost every designer, this is shitty typography. And it's not even that, um, this, is, this is almost the easiest to solve. So maybe you can, I mean, you're already probably familiar with some typesetting rules, or you could get or make yourself more familiar with this, but which is also inherently typographic is that we um, approach it with instructions, and that has a long history, of course. Like, um, that's the special thing about typography, is that you can write typesetting instructions on a piece of paper or in an email, send it to the other end of the world, and if that designer or typesetter is setting the type according to these introductions, instructions, it will look identical, uh, exactly the same. So pre-made glyphs, this is what is in a font, and if you specify how this font should be arranged, then this is entirely reproducible um, across uh, space and time. This is the difference to other forms of letters that you might see, like lettering, which is, can be drawn, or glued together, or cut out of paper, or letter set on these kind of things, or also calligraphy, which has to do with writing, that you have maybe some glyphs that are entirely made out of a stroke, or even a whole word is made of on one stroke. And what is this different uh, to typography with these tools is that it's not really reproducible in the exact same way. So if you try to letter the E or this word, similarly, this will probably work out, but you can never have the exact same thing uh, to do it again so that it looks the same, or you could also not write it down and have someone else do it. Um, so well, this is what also was in the process of a designer for a long time, or not, no, not so long ago, and so phototype was the shortest period in, in design probably, but you sketch out your idea, you maybe do some lettering, you could also write something, then specify, like you spec the layout and the type, give it to a, either a typesetter, or you could sometimes also do this yourself, and then you paste up a, a form that can be reproduced, and then to finally print. And uh, this is what you had to do, like if you were doing the design yourself, you didn't have to specify the whole layout because you could paste it up. But if you couldn't even do the design and make up yourself, um, you would mark up a, a manuscript like the one on the left side. You so see, also see that this is where the term markup is coming from, that I'm marking up I'm writing my specification, my typesetting and layout specification into the manuscript, give this to the typesetter, and then hope for the best that this is the layout that is going to be sent to me afterwards. So there's a long history of not having any control beyond specifying what should be there, but I cannot do it myself. I cannot execute the whole typesetting. Later on, if you could do the layout yourself, you just specify the type, so everything that is uh, happening in a column. So you write down what exact font you use, what exact sizes, line spacing and everything. And then you have sent this to a typesetter and they send you back galleys of type. So previously, if you work in metal type, these were galleys of linotype set lines, for instance, here on the, on the side. And then the typesetter or the printer would make it up into this lockup and arrange all these lines. So you could actually rearrange some of the stuff and break it up so it, it fits images or headlines and these things, but you could never really change afterwards the flow of the line, as it, like the, the, where the line breaks are or the umbruch, as the Germans would say. Uh, in phototype, you also send the manuscript with your markup to the typesetter and then they send back these 
these uh, Satzfahren or galleys of phototype. This is a lady is uh, feeding us through the gluing machine so that you can stack it up into these kind of arrangements like your, your layout. And I think this is also where the grid became so important to work with because you just needed some guides where to glue the galleys and the images and everything. Um, designing or layout was really uh, there was a lot of uh, math going on that you had to calculate how like long or short should be your, your, your columns or the galleys that you're ordering and everything has to fit together. So there was a lot of planning, calculating and also drawing the grid beforehand so that you figured out the page. But really it was used for positioning each item on the page that you were pasting up because this was a manual process, you needed some guidelines. And I think it's just not as important anymore for us to work with as a grid. We now use it maybe to clarify or organize a page, but I don't actually understand where the obsession with the grid, especially the horizontal um, lines is coming from because it makes you almost really inflexible and not all of your design work needs a grid. There's really, like in web design, I. I find, or also UI design, there are very few cases that you actually need a strict grid that you have to adhere to, because people will later on will, won't see it anyway. Um, then later on, the, or this was at the same time, so on the other side, the designer or the paste-up artist became these, these galleys or phototype, but they were made in these kind of phototype machines. The photo was one of the first ones. And you see this is actually like a typewriter attached to a machine, which is, uh, has no display, so you don't even see what you type. And all these additional buttons were for instructions for what font exactly you want, what size you want, what line feed you wanted, and the, all the other measurements. Then, luckily, uh, some years later, the, the, the um, Screens were attached to these machines, but even then you couldn't really see what you were getting, like WYSIWYG was not a thing, but you had a screen that is at least showing you the text. So you don't even see the line breaks exactly or how it will look like, but you see what you type and then you can also make corrections or not really, but because you see it's still uh, fed by, by paper tapes, you know, um, punch tapes, so it's not, it doesn't have a memory, this machine. The memory was on the paper tapes. And uh, above the screen with the text, you see this is all the instructions. It says what size, what, like, what font, what point size, what line height. It's, you see, it's a recurring thing that we have the instructions, the text, the abstract content, never really knowing how it's going to look in the end and hoping for the best. This is also it's, it's something that I picked up from an article from Jean Gable, and I find it's a really fitting quote that is almost more true today than it was in, in the DTP phase, uh, phase shortly before us now, because we, we never know how this layout that we're specifying will end up looking for the actual user of our websites or the applications that you're designing for, whatever screen size they have or what device they have. You have to specify, uh, make good judgments, and then hope for the best. So I think maybe it's, especially with print designers who are around for a little longer and have the era in the back of the mind where you don't have full control and could all do everything yourself, that we are maybe much more, uh, I don't know, failure friendly or I don't, I don't mind at all that I don't know exactly how it will look like or how the lines will break. I just have to um, like think of this when I design it and I have to design it in a way that it will look good in almost all the states that uh, it will end up looking in. Um, of course, designers, like print designers, usually specify things in neat uh, menus nowadays that you have, like, it's, it's sort of CSS but not written down. You have all these checkbox. But if you then see the, the summary of your paragraph styles or something, it is actually pretty identical to writing CSS. And that is something that I think almost all print designers forget that when they, when 
they have a print background and they're super scared of writing CSS because they don't understand this and they think it's all programming and totally complicated. It's exactly the same as working with paragraph styles and, and style sheets in layout programs and everything that you do in these palettes down there and it's not a, a paragraph style or something, that is like an inline style or a span or something. So you should not do this as a print designer either. We, we try to work with paragraph style sheets. And in these style sheets, just like in CSS, there are these parameters um, defined. And the typographers talk about something which is called microtypography and mac macro typography. You might have heard that term. And the typo typographic parameters here, this is what we call micro typography. So everything that is uh, happening within the column, you saw that everything that you would have to specify if you get the column, the galley sent back, like the typeface, the style, the size, blah, 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 everything that you would put into the CSS as well. And then the macro typography is what you would mark up in, like as a layout instruction in the manuscript, like what are the margins, um, the columns, the number of columns, uh, then later on for the printer, the color, and so forth. Um, I'm trying to find maybe a way to help you design for what you do, but without giving you uh, like real rules or also maybe to um, make you more open or not as fearful about typography. And maybe it's helping to go back and think about why am I or why are we doing this anyway? And maybe also what is behind all the, the design that we see. So of course, the idea of typography or everything that is text design is making the content visible in a way. This can even be Adobe Blank as a font, so it doesn't even have to be a typeface, like in, in an alphabetic typeface. It can be glyphs or emojis or anything. Then the second thing is that it should be legible, and legible means that you can identify the letter form, you know what it means, because you know this writing system, and you could technically read it, but that doesn't mean that a legible text is really readable, because readable uh, or making something readable is then the process of making it easy to read and understand the structure and uh, comprehend the text better. So this is everything that you would say maybe makes a, a text nice or pretty or comfortable to read. But maybe this is something that a lot of people, when they talk about typography, is forgetting. And I also see that a lot of these rules that we're talking about coming from book typography or classic print typography that are not really so applicable on the web because almost no web pages that you design work like book typography today. This is maybe the realm of ebooks, and that's uh, another talk uh, uh, entirely. But making something identifiable is so much more important on the web because you don't have the format, the actual volume, the actual object in, uh, object in front of you. You don't immediately see what it is, but with real objects, like, or like with print, where you have something in your hands, you see, oh, this is a lexicon, this is a timetable, this is a poster, this is uh, advertisement, this is, and you, you can judge by the look of something, or look of text, if this is actually what you want to read, or this is for you, or interests you. So even before you start reading anything, you see, uh, I'm looking for the timetable, and you can identify this as a timetable. And that, of course, is also playing with conventions, so that we always design an object or a, um, like a, a round of a problem in the context of the convention. So if, if we design a timetable and it doesn't look like a timetable anymore, it makes it harder to recognize. And that's, of course, a little bit of a problem on the web, which is here maybe um, exaggerated, but typography is really sometimes the only thing that you see on a web page, and you don't know really where you are, if this is a newspaper or if it's a a timetable or a lexicon that you're reading. And we have to build this into our small little column as well, that you, you get the people, give the, this kind of information, what is this actually what you have in front of you. And this is happening between, like these are like the maximum poles, that's the, on the one hand the maximum of attention grabbing, look at me typography or type or text that you are not actually reading, it's more about that you, you look at this and it wants to make you read, even although you're not interested at first. And on the other hand, you have 
the long column of text, the long form, which is all about legibility and making it easy to read and comprehensible. And all problems, tasks, jobs are happening between the, these two poles somewhere. So sometimes the job is more about attention grabbing, like advertising, book titles, posters, are about look at me, look at me, read here. Advertising doesn't want to be read at all. And on the other hand, you have maybe something that has an attention-grabbing headline, but then very calm set text. And even if you just look at the long-form legible um, jobs or problems that you solve, you see that there are conventions just from history that something looks like a novel, maybe more, and something looks more like an informative text, like a newspaper or something. So even although we, we want to make these two texts very legible, we also want to say this is trustworthy information. And we expect a newspaper or trustworthy information just to look a certain way because then you know, oh, this is reliable. I can, I can believe this, uh, the things that are, uh, this is saying here. But if a novel would be set in this way, we would probably find it weird and it doesn't, it, it doesn't have the air and, and flow that we expect from maybe something from Goethe or something. Um, so maybe not thinking so much about the exact media that your text design is going to be applied because a lot of the jobs that we are working on today will have maybe a print part, will have a web part, will have an app, will have posters, will maybe have uh, application on trucks outside and advertising. We should always maybe go back and think about how we use the actual thing that we are designing for. And then it helps to think about how we actually read some of the information. And there are different kinds of reading. Sometimes they are unique to one media, and sometimes they're also happening mixed and, and mingled in, in one object or one um, job. Um, so this is coming from the theory of, of Hans-Peter Wilberg. The Germans among you would maybe also, I would recommend you to read his book, Lesetipographie, which was really influential for me it's from the 90s. And it, of course, talks about print design, but on such an abstract level that you could also still learn something for the web today. And this is uh, what I'm trying to maybe uh, explain to you or bring nearer to you. So that's the boring book novel that we talked about, the typography for linear reading. This is not really what most web pages are about these days, but that is where everything begins or began. The, the, the calm column of text, it's very um, restrained. You have limited choice of typeface, or I mean, we just choose one family, maybe just a limited amount of styles. You probably just have a Roman and an italic, maybe. It's one column. The only thing that is maybe um, the design part is how you break up the paragraphs or something like this. But the undisturbed reading here is the goal, so that you get out of the way for the reader. And you also have a motivated reader here with you. So the person who picks up the book actually wants to read the book. It doesn't have to look like, as classic, so maybe this is now um, closer to what we're working on on the web today, or it doesn't even have to be a static one column. This is also one flow, so it's about how, what's the reading order you read this in. And this is even clear if you don't have just one column, but at least not uh, competing columns. So the classic example maybe on the web is a, a long form blog or medium, everyone is in love with Medium. I have to admit that I'm not a fan of Medium at all for all kinds of reasons, but that is one of it, that I'm, um, that they are forcing um, grayscale font rendering on me is something that I don't like at all. But you even see that there might be some pitfalls in the one column design, because if you break it up too much, then it's also just, it just falls apart and um, you can't even follow a thought that easily anymore if you have a line break everywhere. So it's of course better on the web to have the blank lines in between paragraphs and not just the indents as in the printed book usually because that breaks up longer, longer columns of text but don't, just don't overdo it so that it, it just breaks uh, apart. And that's uh, also the classic thing is that people tend to think that the one column is the better design. And I agree it's easier to follow, but if you have maybe an intelligent, at least starting out with uh, several columns is possible because you know this is like one fold or one page you see at, at, 
at one time. And you see that these other columns, they are stopping within this, this one frame or page that you're seeing. So it's not that you come, you scroll down and then don't know where to continue, but it's if you just have like a sidebar with side information. I think it's still possible to work with several columns and not just have the one, a little bit boring one column designs today. This is not how the great disconnect uh, looks anymore, like the, the previous, this is uh, the current design. And I actually don't think that is so much more successful than the previous one, because it, uh, it's probably not so easy to see, but it introduces uh, of course, the, the content is the same. You see it's the same article. It's just reordered in different ways. But it is trendy to have larger text sizes now. They introduce a, a more sparkling, crisp typeface, which I find a little bit more disturbing. But the thing that I find most disturbing here is that things are competing with each other so that I get distracted by this very huge a pull quote, but I also get distracted by the links in this. So if you look at this page and you would have to say what is the most important part of this page, where, it's, where what would you look at first, it's actually the links. And that is leading you out of the article. This is not what you want to do. So here, integrating the links or, or emphasis more into the text column that you see it at the place when you land there and not at first, that is actually an in, uh, a thing that you want to do for long form reading. And that's also what the typographers distinguish emphasis for something like titles or a link or anything that you want to distinguish from the normal can be in an integrative way or in a more obvious way. This is uh, an example where you don't really know where to read on, maybe, but I've just brought it here for, as an example where the emphasis is not working really well. So you see that if you want to have active emphasis, you have to have a really good bold, which is here not the, the good distinction. So if you, if you are looking for a style that is really actively distinctive from the normal, the regular one, you shouldn't use the medium. Like if this is font style 400 or so, you shouldn't use 500, but 600 or 700 then as the next one, or light and medium and regular and bold, but not just the first. So always just jump over one style maybe. And it's doubling, like if you have a bold style, you don't need the underline also and the italic maybe. So maybe pick one. This is what I was talking about. So if you want to have the integrated distinction that is not disturbing you when you read long form on a text, but it's only noticed when you're actually there, you would use kinds of uh, differentiation that don't change the gray value of the text. So that could be italic or small caps or certain colors that have a similar U. And, and light underline uh, works well as well. So you don't see it when you just glance on the page. But if you want to have selective reading or people finding stuff or see oh, this is the headline, then you want an active distinction like anything that is changing the color of the text, bold, caps is changing it, uh, other tone, font styles, uh, all kinds of things. It, this is more successful here, but this is a, another problem that I see all the time on the web these days, and I find it horrible, and I even see it in the Düsseldorfer U-Bahn that we use way too light typefaces way too tightly set, and then also in gray. I don't know who told all web designers that gray type is uh, more readable than black type. It is not. Black type is the thing that is rendering the best on these shitty screens that we have. I don't know why you want to use gray type all the time, because you're reducing the contrast. And a good contrast is actually what is helpful for reading. So if you want to reduce the contrast because you find black type on white maybe too hardcore, um, you could also maybe have an off-white or something, but like work with the background maybe and not the color of the type. Yeah, way too thin typefaces, but I also find that this typeface is way too tightly spaced to be uh, useful for, for setting text sizes. So look at how the proportions are of these typefaces that you're using, and uh, a reading size typeface has to be much more generally, generously spaced, and they shouldn't bump into each other, these, the glyphs. Um, who was here three years ago when Eric van Blockland gave his talk, well, probably a lot of people were a little bit alienated because it was really hardcore, but he made really cool 
uh, calculations and visualizations what is actually happening with legibility, which is a buzzword in design, and everyone thinks, yeah, it's the battle between serifs and sans, and sans is better than serifs, or blah, blah, blah. He found out, or he proved with, or tried to prove with these visualizations that more is actually better than less. So this is white light doesn't exist. You all know this. This is different, uh, like different colors of light that are jumping in all kinds of angles, and they are blurring into the letter form. So white into the black. On screen, it's even worse because we have a lighting up screen, and you see the fatter, the more the the, the letter form has to offer, the less gets blurred away. These are three ends. I don't know who recognized the, the topmost end there. So smaller is less legible or readable than large. Lighter is much less readable than bold. And if you have serifs, there's also just more stuff there left over from when you see in the second end the inner parts of the stem actually got blurred away already, but since there are some sturdy serifs on there, you can still recognize it as an N. So don't use two light typefaces and have them maybe uh, in a middle, little bit more generous spacing if you want to use them for body sizes. This is another um, pet peeve of mine that I have, that these geometric sands are so hip today, I think we should really stop using them. And there was just a random web page, web page that I landed on two days ago or so. People who follow me on Twitter already saw that, that I have a style sheet for Safari. I use Safari actually all the time, and I have this custom style sheet there that is, um, <laughs> I set up for some websites that I can't read. And it's just swapping out the typeface into output uh, which is also the typeface that I use for my presentation here. And it gets instantly so much more readable for me because, it, I mean, I can, I can see what these glyphs are, but if an A resembles an O so much and it's also, it's, it's rendering so bad that you have to use it in such a large size, it's just not working anymore. And just beefing it up with a simple sans serif that is a little bit more readable uh, can make this this blog post for me actually accessible because I don't want to read the other one. If you use a good typeface, you will then recognize that the type on most of these single column designs are just way too large. It's not looking like here, of course, but if you have this on your laptop and all you see is the 24 pixel body text, then it's just way too large to actually read comfortably because you almost have to move your, your head. So I scale it down until I think, yeah, this is about right. But I think also that the large text sizes nowadays, nowadays are used to paint over that we don't have any design ideas anymore apart from the one column layout. So somebody said one column layouts are cool for responsive design and easy to follow. But this is just not all that we have to put on the page. Maybe someone can also come up with a good design or creative way to make it a little bit more exciting than just this boring side. So if you think about linear reading, the things that you maybe should keep in mind that, oh yeah, I forgot to talk about hyphenation is just not working for anything else than English really. So don't use justified text because if you don't have good hyphenation, it's just not going to look right or work because you have huge gaps. And then if you have so, so small text sizes, you really need a really good, well rendering font like one that is really well hinted and use it in black and not in light gray. I have a pet peeve about subpixel uh, rendering um, compared to grayscale, but you could just find me outside uh, and I talk to you about this over a beer. And um, think about how you style your links in a long form reading so that you're not moving people out of, of your article by having them too attractive or too actively styled and make them more integrative into the design. So the second form of uh, typography for reading is informational reading, which is actually much more often happening on the web. It's, it's like the selective reading. You look at the page, you go through and select what kind of articles or snippets you want to read. You never read the whole thing. It's very structured. You have lots of styles. You have also lots of different sizes, different font styles, and uh, boxes, pull quotes, 
captions, all kinds of things. So this is really well, which is also much more interesting to design, but you have to think, uh, it's a combination of attracting the people and getting them to read your article, but then also let them move on if you just give them some pull quotes and they get what you mean. So uh, a newspaper is the classic form of informing design or informational design. And of course, this is the, the, the uh, principles here is not only applicable to news, papers, but all kinds of editorial sites. And you have, yeah, whatever I said, like graphics and, and photography and illustration. But it's, this is not actually how you see the newspaper. This is how you usually read a newspaper. You could also say that this is the perfect first um, design as a box model or responsive design because you fold it, you hold it close to you, so you can use much smaller font sizes because you adjust the reading distance with it. Some news sites are excellent, but uh, you know all the horrible news sites, especially also from the regional papers in Germany that I didn't bring with you. And there are a few excellent examples, but you see that this is actually the problem of all the editorial sites today, that there's an overwhelm of all these boxes popping up, advertising that is obscuring the content, and how do we organize all the shit that is on these pages and is forced on us on these pages so that people can still navigate in a good way and, and still stay informed and not just leave totally frustrated. There's the opposite trend of all the horrible sites are these super nicely designed editorial pages, like uh, art-directed posts, so you could say that the New York Times is doing and a lot of Vox uh, websites are doing. And they, even at the New York Times, is actually a really good example that not every one of these art-directed posts by them is super fancy and has all kinds of scripts going on and effects, but they also find a way to even make a page with advertising kind of attractive or easy to understand or stand even. Um, these are other, like two random examples of an uh, informative website. And I think that TechCrunch is actually not really a good example because everything is blurring into each other and you don't really know what element is belonging to uh, what. And I mean, white space can be really nice to segmentify things and, and, and separate things, but it's also easily blurring into each other because you don't have, yeah, you have one background color. And just comparing it with a, um, like a homepage like this, is they don't have, I mean, they have a lot of elements, but it's not overwhelming in the same way because you see, oh, this is neatly this, this is this, this is this, and it's much easier also to navigate. And also their article pages are, I don't know, destruction less or they find also a way to make it more interesting with really a, a few tricks like these pull quotes. But you see the biggest problem is that they use the wrong quotation marks and then print people would say, yeah, like all of these editorial sites, Spiegel, online or everything that you visit in Germany, where it's much more um, of course visible because the German quotation marks are so much different than the Americans. So. For informational reading, you should really try to balance the overwhelm of all the elements that are on the page and have to be on the page, um, and still make clear what the hierarchy of the content is. So make clear what is an article headline, where, what are the different sections, how do you go from here, how does your menu work. Hamburger menus are luckily not a thing anymore so much, but it's really up to you to make it easier for the reader to understand the structure of the text and how the hierarchy of that side works. The tricky part here is not that you only have small sizes, but you have to find typefaces that are appropriate to use at the given font size. So you probably need a typeface that is a, a different typeface for the headlines, that it looks good in headlines and large sizes, and a different one for the body, uh, body text. Consultational reading is more about looking up stuff. So you're going there for a specific thing, search for something, usually just read that small part and then leave again. It's not that you sit with a lexicon and think like, oh, I'll just read the O today and let's see how far I get here. And it's of course a fun Sunday part -time, pastime maybe, but you usually go there for a reason and you get annoyed when you don't find it easily. 
This is, I heard, one of the most visited websites in Germany. I never use it. I usually Google the word and then just uh, live with the Google results. Uh, results. But the Duden website is um, the heavy traffic site. This is not the actual design, unfortunately. This is what it looked like until maybe half a year ago or so. You didn't see so, a lot above the fold, but at least you got, I mean, how you spell the word, and if you really wanted to know about the, all the declension and stuff, you go, you scroll once, and then you get all the grammar stuff. This is how the website looks today, and I don't even know where to find the thing that I'm looking for. So, something like, uh, do I have a pointer here? Uh, no, not really. You see, down there, there's actually what you might want to find or how you how you would hyphenate that word and then if you want to see anything of the grammar you have to scroll for two pages and then you have also almost obscured by the horrible web font they are now using using in light gray and it's not just a problem of the the ads of course the ads are super disturbing here but it's also because of all the space that someone told them make more white space around it, and it, ha it has to be like, I don't know, a fancy web font, which now looks smaller than the Georgia or Helvetica that we, they were using before. And it's not just a problem of, of the Duden. All kinds of dictionaries or, or in, uh, like consultational websites have the problem that all these elements on the page are actually obscuring why you go there and want to look something up. So find the definition for lexicon, it's not there on the first page, but this was the page how it looked the Merriam-Webster like half a year ago. It's not nicely designed, you would probably say, it uses system fonts, but it gets the information across. It's like for consultational purposes, it's all about designing compact things where you don't have a lot of white space. You should probably use smaller sizes. You need a style or like a font family that has distinct italic and bolds to have like active emphasis for, for things that you are like the most important information and then some things for the like the, the sub level of information below that. This is the website I use almost all day, have open all time. Maybe a, a couple of you who are like struggling with German and English, and it's horrible, of course, from this, like, fancy design is not happening here, but it's good because it's functional design. It's very compact, you can really easily find what you're looking for, and it's presenting everything in a super logical way. And sometimes it's also helped to design a little bit in the conventional, we should not imitate print, but if we orientate us a little bit, like how lexicas work, that you have something bigger and in bold, which are you looking up, and then you have compactly uh, presented the detailed information below, this makes it also super easy to use and understandable for the people. Another website that most of you will use every day, but it's not really easy to distinguish because with all these different elements on the page and everything is blurring into each other. So sometimes it's horrible, but sometimes boxes or like light color in the background is actually working to structure a page more. This is another sad thing that this is not the current um, DB website anymore, which I also use daily, but this is the current one. And sure, they use now their fancy web fonts everywhere and they made the times bigger and bold, which is of course really important. But it's also with this white space introducing design changes, it's just so much more like takes more effort to find the same amount of information. And I don't know, maybe the designers all have like, these huge iPhone, uh, iPhone, <laughs> iMac screens, and they think that's great if you just see one line of the connection instead of maybe uh, 10 lines at the same time. But I live with a 13-inch laptop all of the time, and I don't have an external screen, and this is what I see. And that's, it's a balance between its fancy graphic design, but it's not really functioning uh, as well enough. So for consultational purposes, you should really, it should all be about compact presentation of the content and that it is really functional for the reader. And also don't underestimate them. You, you can really present stuff in a small size and they are capable of reading or finding the information because they are very motivated. They go there for a reason and they want to find the information. And of course, we will probably read it anyway, however it looks like. But um, it, it's, of course, more uh, successful 
getting your information across when it's actually usable and, and also quicker to comprehend. For orientation purposes, it's actually interesting that very large type on signs has a lot in common with very, very small type in captions or other things, like the smallest and the largest follow the same conventions, and that is that you probably should stick to mixed case typesetting and not use all caps because that is much harder to read, uh, at least at a glance. Of course, if you're talking a button in a navigation and it's just uh, saying something like start and stop, this is probably also working in other, with other graphical cues that you know what is start and stop here. But other than that, lowercase or mixed case setting is always much easier to read and don't have it too tightly spaced if you use uh, the small sizes again. And another pitfall is of course putting everything in boxes. If you have dynamic content that is translated into different languages, then you maybe should choose a typeface that also has uh, a different widths and not just uh, like different weights, so that you could maybe use the condensed version for the German or something like this. This is actually a fun um, method of working for di uh, with like the space constra uh, constraints for the menu by switching to emoji. But other than that, it's really about um, thinking of legible presentation and also a good graphical way to maybe put it in, in a box or with a colorful background um, if you have button-like orientation. But other than that, um, don't like uh, design everything so pixel perfect that it wouldn't uh, work in a different language. That is the section of typography that is actually the easiest. This is where you can do almost everything. This is the attention-grabbing posters, covers, starting pages. Um, record sleeves and whatnot. And you can see that if you scroll, this is the fonts in use website, which is cataloging all kinds of font users. If you scroll through that, you can't even see at first if this is a poster or a book cover or something else, or a website or a sign outside. You can just do almost everything. But this is also where a lot of recent things in font, not technology, but development comes in really handy and makes it very uh, attractive to play around if you think about a larger family that has, for instance, optical sizes. That means that you have versions of the same typeface that are good for large sizes and a version that is really good for um, text settings, for instance. Um, so here you can really play around. Of course, you should still uh, make it sort of readable, but it's more about like the display quality of the text. But it's also here that you really have to pay attention to your quotes or your dashes or apostrophes because if you have something really large, just make sure that you use the right orthography for something. Um, just a quick side note about the sizes that I just uh, mentioned with the optical sizes. The problem is today that the typeface you're choosing is not suggesting to you anymore in what sizes it's going to be used. Previously, a typeface came in a size and you couldn't use it in any other size. So a poster typeface cannot be used for text because it was just large and the other way around. And now you have to decide yourself what typeface is suitable for text, for body copy, for small or for really large. And the cool thing is that typeface designers these days um, saw that this is a loss in phototype or digital type that we don't have the, uh, the differences in, for the different sizes anymore and develop large series that are called optical sizes or size-specific designs where you have versions of a style or of uh, a family for different applications. This is, for instance, the family Benton modern and only the regular styles of it. But it, this is not how you're supposed to see it, but this is how you're supposed to see it. So the first four lines are display styles in different widths. They are also, of course, bold and italics and everything that I didn't uh, just show. The second block are different grades. This is a little complicated to explain in one sentence, but it's, for instance, something you could use to uh, compensate for standard resolution displays and retina displays that you maybe use the second line for the, or the first line for the standard resolution displays and they get a little bit fatter and the second line you use, you send to the retina displays or so and it's, it's uh, a sharper display so that in the end it looks maybe the same but it's really nothing you should worry about first. It's not the most important stuff on uh, 
on in web design, but it's possible. And then the the smallest one is what the font we always call the RE series. These are specially designed typefaces for really, really small sizes. And you see how exaggerated the small version is compared to the display styles where everything is super dragged out and the R is looking hideous almost, but if it's at the right size, you don't even see the exaggerated parts anymore and it just fits perfectly with a family. I, I made a, a small website once with Fontbro or for um, WebType to demonstrate how, what you could do with the series. And this is not the actual design. I'm only showing this because of this little checkbox in, in the top corner. So this was a comp page I, I built. I don't really have the capabilities for um, fancy web design. But if you uncheck this box, box there, you see how many different styles are actually used because now it switches just to one multipurpose typeface, like type variant. It's this, uh, the general sized ones are used for the middle part. And if you use the same typeface for also the big headlines, it just doesn't get, it don't get, uh, it doesn't get distinct enough. And you see it totally breaks apart in the smaller ones. So by applying the right styles or the right variants to the different sizes and leads and intros and the header, you can make a much more interesting design and also easier to understand or comprehend what the hierarchy here is. This is how the website now looks. It's, it's built by Marco Dugonczyk. Um, and the party, uh, it looks totally different. It's still saying the same thing. I wrote a lot of text about how optical sizes and grades works. But the fun part here is actually that there are two CSS styles. There are two designs for the website and just one HTML. So if you, you can't uh, uncheck the thing and change it back to one uh, version of the font anymore, but you can change the CSS and have a totally different design which is uh, using actually the same content. And that is uh, for me the expression of what web design is about or what, what design is about, that you have the content and the structure and then you style it and make it visible for the web and maybe exciting or tone it down, uh, just uh, whatever the, the job is, is asking for. So to sum up is, not about drop caps. Please forget about the baseline grids and everything. This is not what people are caring about or think about when we think about bad typography or web typography. It's usually really just stuff like wrong quotes, dashes, and all that shit. I have a super large pet peeve about four bold and four italic. I know that sometimes it's a maybe interesting way to save some K off of your, your fonts. But um, please only use the bold and the italic styling if you actually have these fonts loaded as well. This is something, this is like a no-brainer I should not tell you about, but check please how these fonts or your whole design is looking across browsers and also older machines. I don't know how many people are uh, working in the Öffentliche Dienst. They're like the shittiest, oldest computers there ever, so please also make the web readable for these people. And Play around with some of the open type features and the st uh, size specific designs, but this is not, and also like whatever polyfill uh, people put out uh, lately, this is not what makes good typography. Just use some of your gesunde Menschenverstand. I didn't know how to translate this. Thank you. Yeah.